This is Find Your Lean Agile Sweet Spot. And I'm going to talk a little bit about product. Uh, I'm Mexican, so I would like you to do an energizer with me. Unfortunately, my shoulder is not working, this one. So I'm going to start a Mexican way with this hand. And can you pick it up, OK? Over to you. One, two, woo! <laughs> Thank you. Great, OK. Right, so this is me. Um, I started as a product owner way back in 2008, just entirely by accident. Didn't know what Agile was, and then I, so <laughs> I ended up uh, running an Agile product, as you do. Uh, but before that, I, my background is in marketing, so I had experience of running uh, and actually delivering <laughs> uh, digital projects. So uh, my my background is in marketing, but I have worked in financial services, travel, higher education, charities, and whatnot. I've also supported um, startups in various guises, and I am a product coach. If you look me up on LinkedIn, you will see I'm a chief curiosity officer. That's how I describe myself, and that's uh, how I like to approach things. So um, I like working with clients, uh, developing product products. I also like training and facilitating, so that is my life. Um, yeah. Now, Scott is not with us, but uh, you probably all know him. <laughs> uh, doesn't really need much introduction. He's an enterprise agile coach and an international, international community builder. And um, well, um, so credit to him because he obviously helped with the presentation, but not here. OK, so why do we do agile? Uh, this is from the State of Agile report, the last one. And people reported this. So uh, we do Agile because we want to enhance the ability to manage cha changing uh, priorities. We want to accelerate software delivery. We want to increase team productivity. We want to improve business and IT alignment. Big one enhance software quality, enhance delivery predictability, improve project visibility, reduce project risk, better respond to volatile market conditions. No kidding, eh? <laughs> improve team morale, improve engineering discipline, better manage distributed teams, reduce project cost, increase software maintainability, and other reasons. Any clue what's missing in that picture? We lost the customer. No one ever mentioned the customer in that uh, whole report. So we don't do Agile because we want to deliver more customer value. How is that even possible? I thought that was the core of the manifesto. So. I want to um, do a very, very quick uh, show of hands. So just, just to know where we are. Um, where are your team, team's products? So are you, raise your hand, please. Are you on a big uh, team? And that's bigger than 30 developers. Raise your hand. OK. OK, I'll, I'll take that. The rest of you are in a small team, so I'm not going <laughs> to duplicate that. There are two types of people, those who can extrapolate information and... OK, so I'm not going to duplicate it. What kind of product are you working on? So are you working on an operation value stream? And by this, I mean um, aligned to the business and kind of customer facing. Right, OK. So. Uh, the assumption is that the rest of you would be working in a development value stream. So you'd be developing capability aligned to delivering that other customer facing capability. Now, where are we in terms of proximity to the customer? Are you delivering an app? So are you close to where the end customer is? Right, okay. Or are you developing an API or uh, other things that are kind of far? Huh? Both? Ah, OK. There you go. OK, so I'm going to talk about Theodore Levitt. Theodore Levitt um, was an economist. 
and he studied product from an economic point of view. And he came up with this graph, which is quite widely used in business and marketing. So his um, idea, his, his key um, takeaways here, is that when you develop a product, um, there are four phases. So you have market development, and this um, is the innovation stage. Then there's growth, then there's maturity. And finally, um, he didn't call it this, but it's a kind of a more used terminology. So I'm going to go with what happened after 65. <laughs> so uh, sunset. And now I'm going to explain those. So market development, uh, where are we? That's where you have innovation. If you were in Gabby Benefield's uh, talk yesterday, you might remember that she was talking about startups and where they're looking for gaps that the big behemoths are not able to actually tackle. So that's, that's this space. So it's a space for disruption. It's a space for experimentation, fast learning. You need fast learning loops. You need to pivot and you need an MVP. This is the space of the pioneers. Those big behemoths I was look, talking about, they're not interested in this space necessarily because it's costly. And because basically, as Gabby Benefield was saying yesterday, sometimes governance, big bureaucracy, and lots of other things kind of get in the way of this kind of innovation. So this is pioneer space. That's, that's why I chose that image. Then you have growth. So you have a runway to take over the market. In this space, the behemoths might have caught up because they might have seen something interesting. So you start seeing competition. Um, you have a proven product by this stage. You have sustained experimentation. You have new features, and the features now are definitely driven by customer feedback loops. You are still big ears towards the customer. And this is a space for growth hacking. Who is a member of Clubhouse? Right? OK. Did you get an invitation when you joined? Yes. Right. OK. So this is one method of growth hacking. There are others, obviously. But uh, if you kind of uh, look for linchpins in the community, that's a great way of growth hacking because you have the people who are influencers and they help spread your product. Then there's maturity. I'm using that image because this relates to uh, Alice in, uh, not Alice in Wonderland, actually through the looking glass. There's an episode in the book where Alice is talking to the Red Queen and the Red Queen tells her that they're, they're kind of playing chess. But the rules are a bit different. And the rules are a bit different because, as the queen says to Alice, she needs to run really, really, really fast and make a lot of effort just to stay in the same place. What does this mean? There is a lot of competition by now. Your product is mature. You have uh, demand has leveled off, but your product income is now sustained. You are competing. This is now possibly a crowded market, or at least you have a few competitors that are also making the same effort as you, trying to listen to the customer, trying to add new features, trying to basically fight for the same share that you are looking at. And uh, well, the new features that you're working on are basically designed to keep up with the market. Uh, can you think of a product in that space? For example, one that has reached uh, Aha, uh -huh. that's one. Yeah, anyone else? A good product that everybody uses. Smartphone? Yeah, it could be. Mm -hmm. Zoom, yes, the excellent example. And actually, the pandemic helped them use that. Uh, growth runway, and now they're in this space. Um, for example, uh, there's an app I really, really like um, that has now got all sorts of good features for uh, running workshops of that. But at the time when Zoom was taking over the market, they didn't have the right features. 
the name of that app is Butter. And I absolutely love it. But they haven't actually been able to reach all the market that they would possibly have reached because they were a bit late. Okay. So this is the last uh, phase, salt set. So by this time, product sales are declining. Maintenance and support may be phasing out. A great example of this is uh, Windows products, for example. So uh, Microsoft does a great job of phasing out its products and sunsetting them. So if you are really keen on Windows 7, you're going to lose support in a few years' time because they're not going to be supporting it anymore. So in terms of this product life cycle, you have um, Obviously, this run away to product development, and this is uh, what I was saying before, it's really expensive, so you're actually going to be making a loss. This is why the behemoths are really not interested in that. They'd rather buy off a startup later, you know, just make an acquisition and actually save the money that they invested there and the effort. Okay. However, the sales start here, obviously, when, when you actually introduce it to the market, because this is all development stage, this is your introduction. It's really expensive to acquire new customers. So um, if you have had the experience of actually launching anything to the market as an entrepreneur, you will know that it's really hard to just gain one more customer. And this is why all those growth hacking techniques come into place. So you start growing. You're, you now have profits. You have sales, and by this time, you get into the client. Um, this is your sunsetting product. Now, this maps to uh, different uh, techniques to, to actually reach those points. So, for example, in the blue, we have design thinking because you have unknowns, you have a bit of chaos, you have uh, you have to empathize with your customer. You have to define. This is the, the whole um, design thinking cycle. So you empathize, you define, you ideate, you prototype, you test. Hopefully you get really good at that and then you have a solid thing that you can then start to develop. So then you move on to the pink and that's a lean startup. So in that space you uh, experiment, you test, you learn. Then you move into the, the yellow, which is the design sprint. And you map, you decide, you sketch, you prototype, you test. Please notice that uh, prototyping and testing keeps repeating because you're still learning about your customer's needs and validating. And then finally, you will have a validated business model. All of this was about learning and experimenting. So this is the space for Agile. So you plan, you sprint, you review, you retrospect. We all know those steps. And then uh, this helps you develop a solid product. Now, your products will, uh, remember the questions I asked in the beginning. You will not necessarily have customer facing products. You might be developing products that are actually um, capability products that are, for example, databases that are APIs that are, you know, developing all those capabilities that the business needs in order to produce those uh, features that will be customer facing. So all products can have this cycle. You have APIs that become redundant eventually. Um, but the key thing is that you need to keep innovating. So you have the old, you have the new, you have the newer, and it's always a runway to and this is all, um, I mean, the, the scale here is time, but there also, there's also a cost scale, obviously. You need to keep investing in developing new products. So, I'm relating this to Kinefin. And now I've told you a story in four parts, a bit like um, Star Wars. And I'm, now I'm going to do the same, because I'm going to tell you the, the prequel. Okay, so um, in the year of the pandemic, I was um, I kind of caught up with an alumni team from my old uni. And uh, 
we used to be part of this kind of leadership club thing, and uh, we organized a series of Zoom calls. So I ran one of those, and I did a talk on Agile because everybody was, you know, hearing about Agile, and, and some people actually had never ever heard about it before, and they knew that I was in this space, so they were interested, and I did the talk. Now, this was a fairly interdisciplinary group, so there were people who were, I don't know, psychologists in, in organizations, um, there were architects, well, not, and uh, one of them was a developer, and he had come across Agile. And then he raised his hand in the call, he said, you know, I, uh, well, I was explaining this, that actually Agile plays in the complex space. No? Um, let, me, let me explain this. So in the, in the simple space in, in Knefin, you have your mature products, you have your sunsetting products, because these are the things that are um, repeatable. You know what's what. For that, you don't really need a lot of experimentation. So where was the experimentation in the previous slides? The experimentation was in this space. So before you actually get to the, the mature and mature and, and sunsetting space. So this is the predictable, this is the simple, we have steps, don't bother. We have a complicated where we have mature products where the customer will actually call the front line of staff and will give them problems to solve. But the problems are also known. So for that we have best practices. We, uh, we know what to do. In the chaotic space you have startups who are still trying to figure out what's happening if you go back to this. There are possibly somewhere around this pink or blue space or, you know, or, or the green. They are trying to figure out in the middle of chaos what is it that the customer actually wants. Sorry. So you might have them in this space, the, the chaotic in, in Knefin. Now for Agile, you have defined new products and that's a complex environment where Agile is really good uh, because of the iterative learning and the retrospectives and the learning loops that still support this, but in an organized way. So I was explaining this in the call and then my friend went, you know, I had experience of Agile and I absolutely hated it. It was like throwing a spanner in the works. And I was like, why, why, why would you say that? And, and he said, well, actually, now that you mentioned this in, in this slide, I've, I've finally understood why it was a spanner in the works because this was a, a, a team that was supporting one of these mature or sunsetting products. He was working in IBM at the time. And Agile was really not any use to them. I mean, they, they did have the ethos of you know, uh, improvement and all this, but um, the whole Agile setup was really not delivering any value to them. It was actually getting in the way. So that was the seed for this talk, because it got me thinking, like, is there a better way of, of doing Agile and, and aligning to the product development side of things? So yeah, you might um, know this, this chart. I, I don't have a... So this is a Stacy chart. This is quite old. It's actually uh, a predecessor to the Kinefin model. So it's a bit of a flipped Kinefin if you if you look at it. In this chaos space, that's where you kind of borderline have the design thinking. This is complex. So you, you have Scrum. That's your agile practices. In the complicated, I, I would probably argue that uh, some Kanban practices are really really useful here as well. That's your flight levels, which are actually not here. I should have put them in there. And in the complicated space, you have Kanban. And there, there's a space for waterfall as well, as much as we don't necessarily like it. And then in the simple, well, you have lean, and you have the improvement practices that, that come with it. 
And why? Well, because this is actually more akin to the manufacturing practices that actually gave birth to those processes. Things are predictable, and you want to make them more predictable. This is the space of the six sigmas of 20 years ago. So now, um, this is from Roman Pitcher. So how, how do you actually align your teams when you are developing this um, different kinds of products? So if you are developing a new product that you are still learning in the market about, and that you need to be implementing new features either to um, understand what your customer wants, to grow your market, or even in, in the mature space where you're catching up with the competition and you need to still be fast in that space, like the Red Queen running in place, but you know, trying to just keep your space. There you need that feature team. On the other hand, if you have a mature, rather sunsetting product, what you need is a component team. Because you're really just maintaining the known. So this would be your end of life product. Here you have product market fit. And this is where you're just launching. And the curve represents the value that you're delivering. So in conclusion, and I know I'm standing between you and at lunch, so I'm going to be quick. <laughs> so understand your product context and your maturity. Keep the innovative work in-house with feature teams. This is important. You're not going to outsource or, or offshore the big important stuff that is going to feed you and that is going to, to give you, you know, this is, this is the sustaining stuff for your product. If, if you actually hire this out to a team that doesn't understand your language, where you have all sorts of barriers, they can't respond in your same time zone, I, I predict disaster. Okay, so the low value, the end of life stuff, well, that, that do offshore it because it's just predictable stuff. That, I mean, they don't need a massive, you know, on time response every time. <coughs> now, if you find your product sweet spot and you use the appropriate agile tools, then you're going to get the outcomes that you strategically need for your business. Okay, so because I. I am curious, I'm the chief curiosity officer, and I like to play. Here is a paper file. Okay, so I wrote some questions here, and I'd like you to answer them, and if you could just leave them on your, um, on your chair when you are done, but ideally, I want this to be a, a paper fight. So you write your answers and you pass the ball to someone else, okay? So here you go. And if you can leave them, uh, in the in the room, I'll pick them up, and then I'll um, get them later, and I will post uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn about the findings that came out of the room. There you go. There you go. Ah, <laughs> sorry. There you go. Don't stop. Ah, they're gone. Okay. So if you can answer and pass them, that'd be great. And thank you. Thank you for playing. <laughs> <laughs>